okay, I, I can't hand back the second midterm yet because I have a whole lot of people taking makeup exams still. So <clears throat> I think I should be done with that um, Wednesday before class. So I'll probably have the booklets out on Wednesday. What else? Okay. Uh, as far as I know, there's, yeah, there better not be a problem set due this week. So, because uh, I haven't written one. Anyway, moving along from, from uh, microwave ovens to the next topic, sunlight, you know, it might seem like a big, some random big jump, but it's really a continuation of the same story I've been telling you. Uh, radio waves, starting with radio waves, we looked at electromagnetic waves, and in the context of radio and presumably trans transmitting voice information. Uh, then microwaves, which was seem different, but uh, it's, it's still the story of electromagnetic waves. They were just electromagnetic waves that had a shorter wavelength and co correspondingly a higher frequency, and we use them to cook food. They're also used for other things, but, but, but the story was really supposed to be about, the, about food and microwave ovens. And now we're going off into sunlight, and you know, another topic, where's this coming from? Well, it's electromagnetic waves again. It's just the wavelengths get shorter still. And in this, uh, for sunlight, the, the waves that are most important are less than a millionth of a meter in wavelength. Uh, to give a name to, a, to one millionth of a meter, it's called a micron. Um, a billionth of a meter, you may have heard of as, it's called a nanometer. Um, a micron is actually a micrometer too, micron. Anyway, uh, the wavelengths of light that we see with our eyes turn out to be just under a micron. They're, they're smaller than a micron. We can't, um, light that has a wave, ra electromagnetic wave that has a wavelength of one micron is invisible to us, but falls into, into what we call infrared light, and specifically a near infrared light. It's, it's, you know, we can't quite see it, but it's, it's close. So anyway, long and short of it is this more story of electromagnetic waves. So just uh, i gotten out of ask, asking questions. I'll ask this one anyway. When you look up at the sky during the day, is the light from distant stars reaching your eyes? How many think yes? How many think no? Yeah, there's a few going for no. It's, nothing goes opaque in the, in the, in the sky uh, by virtue of being day. So that light is still coming through. You just can't see it because it's overwhelmed by this blue glow that's present in the sky. And so part of the story for today is why, why the blue glow? Why is, in, in, in other words, why is the sky blue? Uh, you know, as I think about that, there are probably science fiction movies in which the, in, uh, random planets have different colored skies. Well, sorry, the, the sky is blue for, like, the sky is going to be, the skies of planets are going to be blue. It's just going to be that way. Um, I, I, I mean, guess you could have terrible chemi chemicals in the, in the air that give it color, but otherwise it's going to be blue. So we'll talk about why the sky is blue. And uh, it overwhelms our ability to see, this, to see the stars. There have been stories, and it's somewhat controversial that there are certain contexts in which you can see the, see the stars. If you're in like, the bottom of a deep well and can look right at the, just the right direction, maybe you can see the stars. Or certainly during eclipses, the stars become visible, but not normally. All right, so some things about, about sunlight. Uh, it appears whiter than most, most light. So sunlight appears white, and part of the story here is what in the world does, does white mean? Uh, white is not a primary color. It's, a, it's something we see, but it's, not a, it, it's a little more complicated than just blue, for example. Um, sunlight makes the sky appear blue, as I've just ranted about. Uh, at sun, sunrise and sunset, you get other colors showing up. In particular, you start to see the sun itself uh, shift from being kind of a well, more, more than kind of, from being white in appearance into the oranges and finally into the reds. And so why is the, the rising and setting sun so uh, the color shifted? Where's, where, where's that color come from? And there are times during sunrise and sunset in certain situations where the, the sky itself stops looking so blue and starts looking, starts looking red. So uh, I'll talk about that as well. You know, or, or ask me questions if I forget to talk about certain parts of this. Uh, sunlight reflects f 
for many surfaces, including surfaces that are not nettles. I've talked already about how electromagnetic waves reflect from conducting surfaces, as in metals. Like microwaves, they reflect beautifully off of the metal box of the microwave oven and off of maybe a, a, a heavy spoon that you put in the microwave oven or a heavy pot. Uh, the, the wave reflects. And similarly, sunlight reflects off of metal surfaces like an aluminum mirror. But it also reflects off of surfaces that are not metals, for example, glass or water. And where is that reflection coming from? So that's another story I have to tell you. And last, well, at least last in my list here, it, it bends and separates into colors. So you've seen things like, you've seen rainbows, which is a, one of my, well, favorite topics, I guess. Uh, you've seen colors in, in soap bubbles. Uh, sometimes there, there are other contexts in which you see the colors of sunlight sort of uh, spread out. Light, light scattering off of a cut crystal or, or a, a diamond. So all that stuff. So the questions that I'll go after is trying to tease out all the details of sunlight. I'm first off, just starting off, why is sunlight white? And uh, why is the sky blue? So that's the second question. All right? So here we go. So why is sun, sunlight, why does it appear white? And the answer is this cryptic statement. We perceive 5,800 Kelvin thermal light as white. What is that? Well, as a topic that I talk about in the other semester, the fall semester, is that hot objects emit electromagnetic waves. And we call that thermal radiation. So, so if, if, this, if the story for today were the, the, sto the, the physics of a wood stove, the issue that would come up, well, how does a wood stove convey heat to you and make you feel warm? Well, one is by conduction. When you touch it, you, of course, you feel warmer or worse. Uh, if you uh, go above it, you feel the hot air rising. That's convection. But there's a third effect coming off of, of, of heat transfer from a wood stove known as thermal radiation, or just radiation, in short. And you probably learned that in grade school. The three ways in which heat flows is conduction, convection, and radiation. And the radiation one was the grand mystery. You know, what is that? Well, it turns out that hot surfaces, any, any object that is hotter than absolute zero, which is the bottom of all temperatures. Absolute zero is just as cold as you can get, where there's no heat left to be removed from something. Uh, just for completeness, it is minus, gosh, 273.18 Kelvin. It's so minus 273 Kelvin. Uh, ah, uh, Celsius. Real cold, minus 273, and minus 459 Fahrenheit, also real cold. Liquid nitrogen is, is a, a qu three quarters of the way to absolute zero, liquid nitrogen temperature. It, you, there's still more to go. Anyway, real cold. So anything that's hotter than that emits thermal radiation. Why? Because it has thermal motion going on in it, uh, which is to say it, it's the, the pieces that make it up are jiggling around with thermal energy. Remember that good old thermal energy is this, is this fragmented, disordered energy sprinkled uh, semi-randomly among all the constituents of a material. And the material, those parts just jiggle around. Well, if they're jiggling around, that means they're accelerating, because they were going one way at one moment, and they're going the other way later back. They're accelerating. And if they are electrically charged, an accelerating charge emits electromagnetic waves. So. Your hand contains jiggling objects, these tiny little particles, atoms and pieces of atoms, and, they're and electrons, all, yeah, pieces of atoms. They're jiggling around with thermal energy, and they emit thermal radiation by way of these electromagnetic waves that are launched by accelerating charges. Is that OK? The hotter something is, the more aggressive this thermal motion is. and the, the stronger the accelerations, and two things happen. The electromagnetic waves become more intense, and they become statistically more shifted towards shorter frequencies. So, so first off, the, the spectrum, do I have pictures of spectra? Not, uh, yeah, I, not that I'll show you. If you just look at, at the thermal radiation coming off your hand, pick that as an example. It contains a mixture of waves. Some of the waves came from, from charged particles that were accelerating re relatively slowly back and forth. 
just by random chance. And they emit electromagnetic waves with a long wavelength and a low frequency. On the other hand, some of them statistically, some of these little particles were moving faster than the average and jiggling more, more aggressively. And they emit waves that have shorter wavelengths and higher frequencies. Is everybody comfortable with the idea that, that shorter wavelength and higher frequency go together? Ask me a question if, if that's not, if that's a mystery still. So the, the long and short of it then is that the thermal radiation that comes off of something like your hand is a whole spread of electromagnetic waves going down to very long wavelength, low frequency ones, all the way up to relatively short wavelength, high frequency ones. It's, it's determined in, primarily by statistics. I would say entirely by statistics, but it also, alas, has quantum physics in it too, which is beyond the scope of what, what I'm talking about right now anyway. But there's a, there, so there's a spectrum. There's actually a peak uh, intensity. There's a, there's a specific wavelength and frequency pair at which most, the, which is the brightest, which is the strongest emission from, from say, your hand. And that is related to the temperature of your hand and little else. So as, if your hand would get hotter and hotter, and now if we, let's stop having it your, be your hand. Let's have it be uh, uh, the burner on a stove. If you, if you, an electric stove, you turn on the stove, the, st the stove started at room temperature, you haven't turned it on yet, it's going to have a, a spectrum of thermal radiation very similar to that from your hand. It's a little colder than your hand, but not a whole lot, room temperature. And so it's going to have this, this variety of electromagnetic waves coming off of it, and its peak intensity is going to occur at a certain frequency and wavelength. That's all going to be at, at waves that we cannot see with our eye. Those are all in the microwave and millimeter uh, wave range, an, in, an infrared range. They, are all, they all correspond to parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that we cannot see with our eyes because their wavelengths are too long and their frequencies are too low. We can't see them. But machines can, instruments can. All right, you turn on the burner, it gets hotter and hotter. As it gets hotter, the, the thermal motion becomes more aggressive, and the spectrum of electromagnetic waves that come off the burner shifts to, it's still this, this spread, this statistical spread, but it's shifting towards higher frequency, shorter wavelengths. And at about 500 Celsius, it begins to become visible to us, the edge of, of its thermal radiation spectrum enters our, what we can see with our eyes. And that ends, it, it enters at the, at the red end of the spectrum. So what I've got up here is a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum identified in three ways. At the bottom is, it, is its wavelength. And wavelength, so, so wavelengths, again, like th this is one meter wavelength. This is uh, one centimeter wavelength. That's one millimeter wavelength. And I can't show you one micron wavelength or a little less. It's too, it's too teeny, but it's there, OK? So this is wavelength here. And it's wavelength listed, first of all, it's, 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 it's a backwards axis. It's getting smaller as you go to the right. Sorry, this, it's just typically done this way, which is fine. You just have to be aware of it. It's, there are 700 units of wa the wavelengths in this range are 700 units long. What's the unit? A nanometer, that's a, that's a billionth of a meter. It's really dinky. So this is 700 of them, but that's still a tiny wavelength. So this, this corresponds to a tiny wavelength, tinier still, even tinier, and really tiny down here at, at the right end of my, of my drawing. So the wavelength is getting smaller to the right. It's, it's all small, but it's getting smaller. At the top is frequency. Again, frequency, wavelength. Go, go, they go hand in hand. One goes, as one goes up, there goes down, and vice versa. So as the wavelength gets shorter, the frequency gets higher. And, this, and the, the units of, that I've got here, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of those units, what are the units? They're a lot of cycles per second. The units are 10 to the 14 cycles per second. Uh, that's 100 terahertz. So this is 400 terahertz, 500 terahertz, 600 terahertz, super high frequencies, crazy high frequencies. But there they are. So as the wavelength gets shorter, the frequency gets higher. They're all in, in, in units that are not normally, you don't normally encounter 
Nanometers are really small. They're, they're smaller than you normally encounter. Uh, frequencies measured in 10 to the 14 cycles per second are faster than you normally encounter. But there they are. The last uh, labeling on this drawing is the most familiar to you is the colors. These are what you see when you see an electromagnetic wave having this wavelength or, or alternatively, uh, this frequency. If you see a wave that's got just a little under 700 nanometer wavelength, you'll see it as red, deep red. In fact, it's, I'm not sure exactly where to end this drawing. You, you can, depending on the brightness, you can see reasonably far over there. Um, you see red over here at the longest wavelengths. If, you're, if you see a wave that has something like 600 nanometer wavelength, you see uh, between orange and yellow. As the wavelength gets shorter, you, you get into the green, the blue, indigo, violet. These are the colors of the rainbow, and it's, that is totally not a coincidence. That's where, this is where the rainbow is going to come from, is that these different waves, having shorter and sh as you go shorter and shorter wavelength, you go through the, your eye sees the different colors from red through to violet, and ultimately off the end. All right, so what's the takeaway so far is when you first turn on the, the burner on your stove and it first starts to heat up, you begin to see, as it heats up, you start to see a little bit of red in there. And what that means is the statistical spectrum of light coming off that, that hot burner, uh, propelled, or launched by the little jiggling, thermally, thermally jiggling particles, it, it first enters our, what we can see at the red end of the spectrum. At low temperature, uh, the, the burner is not hot enough yet to have the aggressive motion it needs to emit light that would, we, we would perceive as orange, yellow, green, and so on to violet. Okay? As the burner gets hotter still, though, it starts to emit more red and also orange. And you start to see its color shift. It does, it's not a pure red anymore. It's kind of a, a, a reddish orange, and then eventually maybe orange. And the burner doesn't go uh, much hotter than that. But if you shift over to an incandescent light bulb, it can start to have some yellow light in it. And you get a broader, richer mix of light. Still not much blue, even from an incandescent light bulb. But you get this collection, this, this blend of electromagnetic waves that that individually correspond to these colors, red, orange, yellow, green. So far, we're OK? If you get up to really hot, how, how hot is really hot? 5,800K. What's K? K is the Kelvin scale, which I guess I haven't talked about much this semester. The physicists and, and some number of scientists work in, in Kelvin. Kelvin is a lot like Celsius, which is at least somewhat familiar to, to all of you. The Celsius scale and the Kelvin scale have the same spacing between degrees. The only difference is the Celsius scale has, has, has negative temperatures allowed. You can go, the zero of Celsius corresponds to the, the melting, freezing temperature of water. And so you can go below, you can go below zero. It happens all the time on cold days. You go below, below zero Celsius. The Kelvin scale is, is the Celsius scale shifted so that at zero of Kelvin, and the word degree doesn't show up anymore, it's just called Kelvin. It's zero Kelvin. That's absolute zero. So there, it's, it's shifted relative to the, to the Celsius scale by 273 and, and, and change de degrees. So zero, zero, yeah, so zero Kelvin is, the, is just the bottom. 5,800 Kelvin then is about 5,500 Celsius, if you undo the shift. And that is approximately the surface temperature of the sun. The, surf, the sun, of course, is, is, is gas. It has no solid surface anywhere. And so the surface that we're thinking about when we talk about the, the, that, the, the surface temperature is the, the visible surface, where the light comes from. We can't see into the center of the sun. Even though it's gas, it's opaque uh, beyond a certain thickness. So we, we're seeing that what's called the photosphere of the sun. It's, an, it's outer surface where the density of the gas gets high enough that it begins to really interact a lot with light. And it, 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 it's basically an opaque surface we can't see into and beyond it. So we're looking at the surface of the sun 
that surface is about 5,800 Kelvin, and it emits what we perceive as white light. Um, what is white light, then, from the sun? First off, it's, it, we perceive it as very white light. It's whiter. We, white light has a lot of, there's a whole variety of, of, of what are officially talked about as white lights. So let me turn on the, these, That's, these guys, those are white. I, I don't know you, whether you guys can see them. I can turn on the spotlight catalog lights, these guys too. Yeah. These lights, this one, th these things up here, and these things here, are what are called incandescent light bulbs. They have hot filaments inside them. Uh, all of this is going to be phased out with LEDs eventually, but right now they're still incandescent light bulbs. And there, the temperature of the, of the object in there that is emitting light for thermal reasons is about 2,800 Kelvin, about half the, half the temperature of the sun on, the, on an absolute scale, much cooler than the sun. And consequently, the light that comes out is shifted. It's, here's the spectrum for, well, here, here's what the, I can show you the sun spectrum. I've got it on here. Down the, down the. This is for the sun. Uh, same, same backwards wavelength scale, going from long wavelength to shorter as you go to the right. Same frequency scale, going from low frequency to higher frequency as you go to the right. It, we just zoom back so we can see more of the electromagnetic spectrum. If we went over here to the left, we would find uh, uh, micro, uh, millimeter waves, which are shorter than, micro, than, than, than microwaves. Microwaves, radio waves, they're all over here on the left. It's, it's the same electromagnetic wave spectrum. It just, they differ only in the fact that the wavelengths are getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And suddenly we can see these guys, wow. Uh, if, you, if you go to, uh, to the longer side of the, of, if you go out of the visible, out of the range that we can see, and you go to the long wavelength side, and therefore low frequency side, we call the part near the visible, we call it infrared. It, it's, yeah. Are there colors that, that, that are not in the visible spectrum that we sort of don't know, don't have to identify? We can't see them. Some animals can. So their perception of color is different from our perception of color. Uh, I grew up with the, 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 the word on the street was like dogs can't see color, but they can. They, they do have color vision. It's not the same as our color vision. So some, some good fraction of the animals have color vision. They see different colors than we see. And you know, <laughs> until you get some sort of freaky Friday thing where you get thrown into the head of a, of a dog, um, you'll never know what those colors look like. OK? Yeah. What about people who are colorblind? Um, I can give you, I'll, I'll give you a, the story of how, how we perceive color along with this. And I, I can explain the colorblindness as part of that. Um, to do this, let, 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 me, let me finish off a little bit with, with why sunlight's white and, and whiter than, that, than, than light bulb white or candle white. And then I'll talk about color blindness issues. Um, we see the visible range. That's all our eye can, can sense. The infrared, we can't sense it. You can feel it sometimes as, as, as heat on your face from, say, a, a, a hot stove in front of you. But you can't see it with your eyes. Uh, on the Short wavelength, high frequency side of visible is a, is a territory we call ultraviolet, which again you can't see. This causes uh, sunburns and stuff, but you can't see it. Uh, it can make certain chemicals glow in the visible, and those chemicals we talk about as being fluorescent. And a lot of you end up wearing fluorescent colors, uh, hi highlighters and stuff like that. Those are all fluorescent materials. They, when, when exposed to ultraviolet light, those uh, absorb the ultraviolet light and then re-emit visible light, which is how that's, that works. And I can talk about that down the road. When we talk about uh, discharge lamps, I'll talk about that. So we see from the sun, we see, this is the whole su the sun spectrum. It, it goes all the way, in principle, all the way into the radio waves. But it drifts through the microwaves, through the millimeter waves. Which millimeter waves are just, are just waves with wavelengths shorter than a millimeter, into the infrared and finally into the visible and out into the ultraviolet. The 
part we see is this part. And you'll notice that for, for sunlight, it's a pretty smooth blend of, there's a lot of red, there's a particularly large amount of green, and there's still a lot of blue. And then it rolls off in the ultraviolet. But the point is, is that the intensity of the, of the different frequencies here is pretty much the same. Factors of you know, 20, 30, 40%, but not big deals. If you turn down the temperature, for example, by shifting to these incandescent light bulbs, this spectrum, the spectrum that those uh, the tungsten surfaces up there create, or the carbon particles in a, in a candle create, when they're hot, hot, hot carbon particles in a candle, they don't have the same uh, nearly flat distribution of all visible wa wa wavelengths. They, they peak in their intensity somewhere around red, and maybe even to the left of red in, in the area that we would call infrared. And they, they then have very little intensity left by the time you get to the blue, and certainly not much in the, inf in the ultraviolet at all. So incandescent light bulbs, they are not hot enough to emit a lot of the short wavelength, high frequency waves we call blue, and, and le less still the ultraviolet. So if you've ever, um, yeah, what, what do it? If you, if you paint light bulbs, people do this, they paint light bulbs different colors and, and therefore sort of filter the light coming off of an incandescent light bulb. The red, a bulb that you paint red still looks pretty, pretty bright. A bulb that you paint green, medium bright. A bulb that you paint blue, really dim. There's just not much blue light there. If you filter away the other colors, the blue is, is terrible. It's not very bright. This probably explains why blue is not used in traffic lights. It's that uh, if you put a, a traditional traffic lights, as you know, were just filtered light bulbs. Well, maybe you don't know, but, but in the, nowadays you're used to these fancy high-tech light systems. But in the 50s, for example, traffic lights have just a, they had an incandescent light bulb inside and then a filter in front. That's all they had to work with. And, and if you did that with blue, a blue filter, you wouldn't have much light left. Uh, this is a problem for stage lighting. In the, in the old days, you want to try to, to, to shine a red, red spot on one person, a blue spot on the other person. The blue spots can be pretty dim, because there's not much blue in the incandescent lamp. So I, have I said, said enough on that story? So what we see as in sunlight is defines white for us. We see, we see that spectrum of light uh, peaking somewhere in the green-blue range uh, as white light, that whole mixture. If you shift the mixture to, the, to, to the, the left on this drawing by having it come from a cooler surface, very hot but not, not as hot as the sun, it, it's, it's short on blue, heavy on red, and it begins to look more reddish. So, so you can get used to uh, looking at things in, illuminated purely by infrared light, ah, incandescent light, and say, well, that's white. And you can get used to seeing uh, uh, surfaces, objects illuminated purely by sunlight and saying, oh, that's white light. But if you see them simultaneously, those two illuminations, incandescent illumination and sunlight illumination, it becomes very apparent that the sunlight is much bluer and the incandescent illumination is much redder. All right? Uh, makeup mirrors will often have both choices for illumination. You get, you get to choose incandescent illumination, you get to choose sunlight illumination because you look different in those two illuminations. Different mixture of, of light hitting you. you, you if, if there's no blue coming at you from the incandescent light bulbs, you're not going to reflect blue. There's no blue. Uh, so you will look different. All right. Color blindness, or color, uh, uh, heading off to that. How do we see these colors? So this is a, this is a topic that, that, that I typically discuss in the context of, of uh, fluorescent lighting and stuff, but, I'll, but I can talk about it now. We, when we see a s full spectrum like this, all the wavelengths present, peaking in this range, and, but having substantial blue, substantial red, our eyes perceive that light as white. Our eyes actually have we, have, we have two kinds of sensors in our eyes. 
uh, the, the, the cells that we have in our eyes, they are known as rod cells and cone cells. Those are the two classes. The cone cells are our color vision. The rod cells are our night vision. And rod cells are very light sensitive. They have no color sensitivity, though. They just see light or not light. And so on a dark night, when, when you're, you're trying to make your way through the woods or something like that, and maybe the, sun, maybe the moon's out or maybe not, uh, you have very little sense of color. You can see the, 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 what's in front of you. Uh, you. You're particularly sensitive to what's in front of you in your peripheral vision, which is rich in rod cells, these, these very light sensitive but not color sensitive cells. Your central vision, your, what, your macula or fovea, the, that, the part that, that you see most acutely, is almost exclusively cone cells, your color vision. And it's not very good for night vision. So this is why when you're walking around in the dark, your, your central vision isn't all that great. In fact, you, you, you're, you're, best, you're most sensitive with your peripheral vision, all those rod cells. So far, so good? In fact, you, your rod cells can see farther into the infrared than your color sensors can at all. So, so in the, uh, if you're looking at a hot object that's not even hot enough to make red light, you can still see it with your peripheral vision. Your rod cells can still see it, but they have no color sensitivity. So you notice, wow, that thing's glow that, I see that thing glowing over here in my peripheral vision, but it just looks kind of colorless. It's just, uh, just a glow. It gets a little hotter, begins to emit light that you would identify as red. Now your central vision can see it and says, ah, that's red light. Now it's a little hotter, I can see it with color. All right? So uh, your, your rod cells see, see no, no color sensitivity, very high light sensitivity. Your cone cells, you have three kinds of them. A normal person, has, a person with normal vision has three kinds of, of cone cells. They have cone cells that sense light in the red portion of the spectrum. That is, that is over here in the wavelengths from about 700 nanometers to, I don't know, about uh, high 500 nanometers. So this range, your red cone cells go, ah, I see light. If, if light in the other portions of the spectrum hit your eyes, your, the, your red sensors do not see them except there's a funny rebound over here in the, in the near ultraviolet, just way over in the violet, your, your red sensors also begin to see the light again there, too. You have green sensors. You have, you have cone cells that see green and near green. And lastly, you have blue sensors. You have cone cells that see blue and near blue. So three kinds of, of cells, they look for red, one of them is looking for red light, one of them is looking for green light, one of them look, looking for blue light. And between the three of them, they can see the whole range. The, it, it, light that comes in can, will, at a particular way, will certainly get the attention of at least one of those sensors. But often, it will get the attention of two of those sensors. For example, if light comes in that is technically yellow light, meaning that it's, that it's here right around 600 nanometers, that light is technically yellow light, it gets the attention of both your red sensors and your green sensors. Your, both of them trigger, and your brain interprets that as something in between red and green, namely yellow. OK? So you don't have, you don't have a true spectrometer in your eyeballs with, that, can, that can nail exactly what wavelength is coming at it. All I can tell is I see my, my red sensor and my green sensor is simultaneously sensing light, I must be seeing something in between, yellow. But it also turns out that if you shine a mixture of deep red and, and pure green light at your eye, that same mixture, that, that mixture, um, it, your, your red sensor and your green sensor, not surprisingly, both go, I see light. And so they say, ah, your brain goes, it must be something in between, yellow. But you've been tricked. Your eye is not actually seeing yellow light. It's seeing simultaneously red and green overlapping and hitting the same cells. And the cells go, this must be yellow light. C can you see how that would trigger the same effect? Or what the difference is? I mean, I want to make sure everybody understands the difference. There is, what's, there is what we can say is really yellow light. One wave, pure wave at 600 nanometers. Alternatively, we can send two waves, one in the red part of the spectrum at, say, 
650 nanometers, and one in the green, say, at 530. Those are two waves, neither of them yellow. Individually, you would see this one you see green, this one you see red. Do them both at once, you see yellow in between. It's tricking your eyes. And this, incidentally, there's no yellow light right, right there where that yellow band is. There's no yellow there. That is a mixture of red light and green light. If you came up and looked really close, and you can do this on your television sets, although the television sets, the, the pixel sizes are getting so dinky, you have to get a magnifying glass out to see it. If you go look, there's no yellow. It's red and green, right next to each other, so close to your eye can't distinguish them, and it's making your eye see yellow. Is everybody okay with that, 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 this trick? Many that, all your technology, it photo, print photographs, a whole lot of things are, are using that trick to, to make you see all the colors. Uh, your, your, all your video technology, they only have three colors to work with, approximately, three, three wavelengths to work. Three they work with three colors, the details, I, I, I'm, I'll set aside. They've got red pixels, they've got green pixels, and they've got blue pixels. And by putting them so close together that your eye can't, can't uh, resolve them, and mixing the three color, colors, they can make you see on any color. And they do. They trick your, your three color sensors. OK? Um, when we see light that is not only red and not only green, but also blue, all, if all of our sensors go together, go, wow, we, we all see light, our brain interprets that as white. The, the proper balance between the red sensor jumping up and down, the green sensor jumping up and down, the blue sensor. When they're all jumping down the right amount, we perceive white. Um, it's not a real color. It's, a, it's this blend of all, all of them. How about color blindness? Color blindness comes about when, when something about those three color sensors is either different from the normal person's trio or one of them is simply absent. Um, one of the most common color blindness is, is red-green problems, people who, who, who can't distinguish red from green. I think that the two possibilities are that the one of them uh, is color shifted, that its, its peak in sensitivity is much closer to the other one. So the red and green, they're looking at almost the same light. And they can't, uh, subtle differences make them see differences in, in, in those two colors that they can't distinguish. And the other is that they just simply have have, don't have that pair. They, 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 have, uh, they have a blue sensor and they have a red-green sensor, in which case they just can't distinguish red and green. Uh, so it's some, it's some variation on, on, on that kind of problem. And uh, it's, amazingly enough, it's possible to get to, to your age without ever figuring out you're colorblind. It's almost, it's almost exclusively um, in, in men. Very rare for women to have colorblindness. It's, it's, it must be linked to the Y chromosome. And um, in college, I, I was taking a biology class, and they had those, those books that have the, the color dots. Have you, have you done the color dot thing where you look at, and they've got numbers in them. And you can, if you're not colorblind, you can see the number. If you're colorblind, you, you can't see the number because you can't distinguish the dots that distinguish the number from its background. And one of my friends was going through this going, there's no number here. You know, you're kidding me. There's no number here. No. And he'd, he'd gotten to age 20-ish, and uh, this, was a new, this was totally new to him. Anyway. I couldn't, he, he, it was a subtle one. It was like, a, it was a red-green problem. He couldn't, he couldn't distinguish it. They're, they're, some of them are pretty dramatic. Um, but but he, this one, he could see the numbers on some of the pages, but a couple of the pages, there's no number here. All right? Surely some of you are colorblind, but I'm not going to go anybody is. You know it. OK, so the sunlight, sunlight is it's a thermal, it's, it's light emitted by a hot object. So it's a thermal spectrum of light. It consists of, of a whole lot of waves. All, I should say also, the waves are, are, are coming like buckshot at us. There are countless individual waves, because each, each wave originated in the thermal motion of in principle of one charged particle on the sun's surface. So they're all, lots of little waves all coming off by themselves. They're a statistical mishmash. They 
have wavelengths as short as, uh, as long as in the radio, uh, as short as way off into the ultraviolet and beyond. The, the, statistically, the, the intensity, though, peaks somewhere in the visible, uh, roughly sort of the, the blue-green range. There's certainly a lot of intensity in the red and, and in the blue. Um, what else? The ultraviolet light, uh, some of it makes it to the Earth. Some of it's absorbed by the famous ozone layer, which was a big deal m mostly before your time. But uh, the, the, we, were, we were polluting the atmosphere with, with chlorine compounds that were catalyzing the destruction of the ozone layer and allowing more ultraviolet to get through. And uh, that, that seems to have healed pretty decently at this point, but uh, who knows what will happen in the future. All right, so that's the, that's the sun spectrum. Um, you've heard of sunspots, and sunspots are actually parts of the sun's surface that are not at the full temperature of the, the general sun as it, uh, itself, and they they're often show up in, the, in a book or in the press or something like that as a, as a dark spot, like black. Well, they're not. They're just not as bright. For, first of all, they're not as hot, and therefore they emit a little less intensity and a little longer wavelengths. Uh, they're still bright as can be, but not as bright as the sun itself. Okay, so uh, their spots is an overstatement. What else? Uh, nah, I'm not going to do this. All right, this one I will do. So, okay, so so. The sunlight was created at the sun's surface, this what's called the photosphere, not an important name, but basically the, 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 the outer, outer periphery of the, of the sun itself at a temperature of roughly 5,800 Kelvin. Um, and it works its way across uh, space through empty space. Good thing that electromagnetic waves don't need anything to travel in because there's not much between us and the sun. They work their way across that, that empty void and then they encounter the Earth's atmosphere. And when they encounter the Earth's atmosphere, things happen. So this question here, when, it, when a light wave encounters an atom, its electric field polarizes that atom slightly. Po atom's got charged particles in it, right? It's got, a pro it's, got, it's got a nucleus that's positively charged and electrons that are negatively charged. What do electromagnetic fields do? They push on those. So, so uh, I mean, these, these, these question and answers are not so wonderful, but okay. How many think that the atom can absorb and re-emit the wave? How many think that the atom cannot absorb the wave? How many think that, that the atom cannot emit a wave? Okay, there, there are a few votes for, the, for B and C, but the majority of, of the rare voters are going for the atom can absorb and re-emit the wave, and that is true. If you think about that, an, so, so you got an atom. An atom left entirely to itself is pretty is pretty symmetric. Uh, it's got it's got electrons on the outside. Their exact behavior we haven't talked about yet. We will. Uh, and its its nucleus, in principle, sits at the center, doing not very much, with the electrons whizzing around it in some manner. Uh, but it's pretty symmetric. But if you send an electromagnetic wave past this atom, the if, you, if at one instant in time we take a flash photograph again, and we'll see that the electric field is, is pointing up in this atom, it's going to tend to shove the, the nucleus upward. It won't respond very much because the nucleus is, is pretty massive. It just can't, you, you can't get it to accelerate very quickly. But the electrons are very light, fluffy guys, and they're negatively charged. They tend to get shoved opposite the electric field, and they'll, they'll move, and they'll certainly accelerate. And so when that wave encounters an atom, it tends to jiggle the electrons up and down. Nu nucleus a little, but not much. All right? Well, electrons that are jiggling up and down, that's how you receive an electromagnetic wave, is by driving charge up and down an antenna. And once the charge is moving up and down the antenna, that's how you emit a wave. So you end up getting the charge in the atoms to jiggle up and down, and they can re-emit they can absorb and re-emit the waves that go by them. So in principle, at least in principle, that can happen. In th that brings us then to why is the sky blue, and I guess I'm about, I have about the right amount of time to do this. Uh, yeah. Um, when, when the waves encounter atoms themselves, they'll get the charge moving up and down a little bit. 
And in principle, the, 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 uh, the wave can be absorbed by the atom and then re-emitted once it's been absorbed. In practice, though, the atoms are so small compared to the wavelength of the waves in visible light that the atoms don't do very much to, to the light themselves. They're too tiny. If you think about the, the story of antennas, I told you at great length about antennas. And the most effective antennas for, uh, for a radio wave are antennas that are, if, if it's out in the open, half the wavelength long. Half, remember the, the half wave antennas? We also had quarter wavelength antennas that they had a conducting surface below them. But anyway, really nice antennas are half as long as the wavelength of the wave they're dealing with. All right? Well, that would mean a really good antenna for, for sunlight. Sunlight has waves ranging from about 400 nanometers to 700. Well, a half wave antenna would be about, a hun uh, about 200 nanometers to about 350. So that's not very long, but 200, 300, 350 nanometers, that's a lot bigger than an atom. How big is an atom? It's, it's less than a nanometer. It's more like a tenth of a nanometer. It's really dinky. So it doesn't make a good antenna for, these, for the waves in visible light. It does instantly make a, a good antenna for the waves in x-rays. And this is a problem for x-rays. So one of the issues they have to deal with in x-rays is the atoms, the atoms uh, absorbing the light and sending it off in a new direction. Uh, x-rays are very short wavelength electromagnetic waves, so short they're on, they're on the, the scale of atoms. Visible light, not so much. You need something bigger. You need a little particle or a little collection of air atoms. A, 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 little, a local region that just by happenstance had a little pileup. A bunch of atoms, just were, they were just jiggling around randomly like gas atoms do, and they all just piled up for one random reason in this spot for a brief period of time. And when they do that, they make a little particle that's a little more on the scale of, of, of the, uh, more like a half wave uh, of visible light. In that case, the light can scatter. The light gets absorbed by this little collection and sent off in a new direction. And that behavior is known as Rayleigh scattering. Rayleigh scattering is the scattering of light. It's a, re a redirection. It's the absorption and re-emission of light due to the temporary absorption and re uh, the, 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 due to the charge motion in tiny particles. Particles that are, that are too small particles that are sm much smaller than the wavelength of light, but not so small that they don't do anything. I'll show you Rayleigh scatter in two ways. Ugh, we're getting late. One is, this is a block of, of silicon rubber. Um, it has extremely small particles in, much smaller than the wavelength of light. But, but the light that you're seeing, this, you know, it's, it's a white light. You know, what color are you seeing scattered toward your eye? Blue. You're seeing blue because the blue light is, has the shortest wavelength of the visible lights, and the lights in white light. Blue is the shortest wavelength. It's the one that these particles are best able to scatter. Because they're too small to be really good antennas, but at least they're decent antennas for the short wavelength stuff like blue light. Is that OK? And when the blue is missing, the blue has been redirected. You're seeing it now. What comes out the end is what's left, the red light. Yeah, you see an orange, right? The blue light's been, been picked off and thrown away by this scattering process. Which, which called, it's called Rayleigh scattering. I can show you the same effect here. So this, this looks, you know, clear, clear water will send the water through. I'm going to turn that off. Side projector, no. And I'm going to add a chemical to this. One, two, three. They will start to make tiny particles. And the particles, it, it takes them about three minutes, two minutes or three minutes to show up. As the particles get bigger and bigger, they'll begin to really scatter the light. Let me turn off some of these extra lights. And as the particles show up, they'll begin to scatter the light that's going through them. They'll preferentially take the blue. Because that's the light that managed to get those little, those little particles charged moving and make a decent antenna out of it and redirect the light. So you'll see blue light start to come off this jar. And the missing blue light 
will deprive the light on the screen of blue. What will be left? The red end of the spectrum. So, the, so as this happens, it's starting to happen. You already can start, I can start to see a blue glow in here. Um, actually, I, probably can, I, I, can, I can probably get more there. Yeah. As the blue glow sh start, sh shows up, the sky is blue then because of this Rayleigh scattering effect. It's, it's prim even in the clearest, cleanest air, it occurs because of, of aggregations of, of little air molecules. If there's dust in the air, though, extremely fine dust, uh, volcanic ash, very tiny particles, too, too small to be good antennas, but at least uh, capable of being decent antennas for the blue. You get a rich blue glow to the sky due to this, re this redirected light. You know, now you can see there's an awful lot of the blue is being picked off and sent to your eyes. And the red is starting to, to, to become, uh, you know, that's all it's getting through. Uh, I'll talk, I, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll, on Wednesday I can talk a little about the sunset stuff. You can sort of see where this is all going, I hope. But uh, I ran us out of time. <laughs>